Hello. Welcome, everyone. I think we're ready to get started. So I want to welcome you to uh, App Design and CSS Styling with the ArcGIS JavaScript 4 API. Uh, my name is Alan Laframboise. I'm a software engineer at Esri, and I'm here with Juan Carlos Franco, uh, goes as Franco. And uh, we're going to step you through um, some different demos and some important points to help you design and style applications better. All of the slides that I'm showing you here are on slides.com, uh, a la framboise. So if you go there, it'll have all the important links and everything uh, to all of the slides that we're showing here and to some of the resources that we're showing as well. So it's slides.com slash a la framboise. Okay. So we're going to talk about app design patterns, and, and you can see there's a number of them laid out here, from layouts right down to working with the raw CSS and the SAS itself. But the overarching concept that we want to kind of get across today is the concept is that with the framework, the new framework with the JavaScript 4 API, we can do a lot more with less CSS. There was a time we had to do everything with CSS and use at media and all kinds of handlers in there, uh, even JavaScript handlers and event handlers. And now we can use the strength of the framework to really uh, help us build applications. So one of the repositories that I'm going to be showing you today, uh, again, just linked out from the slide deck here, is this ArcGIS.js app patterns. Uh, these are really app UI patterns. They're, they're, they're different. Problems I think that you're going to run into or maybe you've already run into them and it's basically a collection of projects that I've put together um, So that that basically we've got everything in one place and I'm going to keep stockpiling more little small vignettes in there And we'll see those in a second So we'll start with layouts uh, layout is one of the first things that you deal with when you're designing uh, mapping applications and uh, We can consider the very simple case, which is the full page map layout so I'm just going to move over to that repository that I was just talking about. So it's called RTS, uh, JS App Patterns. And then in there, I've got a link to this little landing page. And this has all of the little vignettes that I'm going to be showing today. So we have everything from the, from the layout to the UI to the widgets. So we're going to cover these one by one. So we'll start here with the full page layout. This is a very simple scenario but still worth looking at. Um, so what we have is a map that expands and contracts and it resizes based on the width of the browser. How we build that uh, is very simple. If we look at the code, we basically set up the padding, the margin to zero, and the height, and the width to 100%. And that provides, uh, if you're wondering why we have that styling there, and that's to reset the browser. So we can't always trust what the browser defaults are going to be, so that's basically why that's there. And then we're able to take the view div, which is also marked down here in HTML as an element, with uh, the view div ID, and then we hook that into our container. So when we load in the ArcGIS library, so we have the CSS that loads and we have the library itself, then what happens is when the view is created, it grabs that container and it starts to add elements, DOM elements to that container. All right, so this is very straightforward, but this is our, our basic starting point. Then another design is where what I call the parcel page design. It's where you're using uh, like a more advanced grid. So maybe a flex uh, or a CSS grid or something like that, some sort of framework. And in this case, this is a parcel page. So how do we get our map in there? What does the map do when it's in there? How do we style that and so forth? So we can take a look at that. Go back to our patterns. The first one we'll look at is the uh, grid layout. So Flex is awesome. It's been around for a while. It's one of the display options that we have inside of browser frameworks. And you can see that here we're just changing the columns to rows at different sizes, right? So this is all happening through Flex CSS styling. So we'll go take a look at that one. And basically down here we've got a wrapper that's set up with a header, a map, a couple of sides, and a footer. So that's the structure of the DOM, or the elements that we have. And then we have our wrapper set up with flex. It's a row type wrap, and it's 100% width and height in this case. So that's going to use the entire width of the page. Then all of the objects that are within the wrapper are uh, 
uh, flex based as well. And then we use the good old at media calls here. When we hit certain breakpoints within the browser, in this case, uh, 544 and then 780, then we're gonna tell the elements to do something different. So we have these classes assigned. We can change the order so we can stack the map first, second, or third, and, and so forth. So again, if you plan on using Flex as your display, then you can use this sample as a starting point. It'll help you uh, basically get started. But the point here is also that the map, the map is going to just behave in its container as a flex element. So we use flex as well as the base uh, CSS display, um, and it's gonna work as normal, and as it should. The other one I want to look at is the CSS grid. So CSS grid is one of the newer browser frameworks that's basically just built right into the browser, right? So here we have a header and a sidebar, and as I change the size of the page, you can see that I collapse that. So it's very similar to what we saw in Flex, except we're using a completely different framework, and this one um, is a lot newer. So I'll show you what this looks like. So we can go to the code, and similar to Flex, we have a wrapper container around everything, and then we have um, three elements, a header, a sidebar, and then our map div. Um, how those are defined up here is our wrapper is a display type grid, and then we define these template areas, header, sidebar, and map. And it's so cool that you can just name these whatever you want, and you can hook into the CSS grids um, by their name and set up their, the template areas, which basically lays out how these areas fit within the page. And, and again, we use uh, at media here based uh, on at media breaks, browser width breaks. We are going to you know, change the column, change the rows, and change the areas. So this is, again, a nice small example using CSS grid. And again, the map is going to behave as it should behave in its area in the CSS grid layout in both um, desktop and mobile view. Okay. So let's talk about frameworks a little bit. Um, one that's fairly popular and just recently released is Bootstrap 4. So what I did is I put together a little application here just based on one of their templates. So this is just one of the template pages that they have. Um, and we have some, some translated, uh, some rotated elements here. And you can see that the map control is happy. It will live in the different containers that Bootstrap provides. Uh, in the center of the page here, you can see that I have the search widget just embedded in. I haven't done anything except style it to be a little bit larger font-wise and line height-wise. Um, and then we have the other maps on the page, and these guys are all hooked up so that when you change the, uh, the location, they'll all work together. So um, with the ArcGIS GS4 API, um, it works fine in Bootstrap 4. Um, there's no conflicts with the CSS classes and so forth, so um, there's a little sample for you. Okay. Okay. Um, and then let's take a look at the view, because the view is really the heart of the system, and the view has a DOM, right? So like I was explaining in that very first demonstration, when the view is created, it hooks into the, uh, the, the container that you give it, and then it's going to populate itself with the elements that it needs to survive. So we can look at it and break it down into a couple different areas. There's the main map container, and it has a few classes in it that are important to recognize, like Esri View, um, and then it designates itself as Esri View Height Large, uh, Esri View Width Large. So what happens is when the view is created, it's looking at the size of the browser, and it's applying classes so that the rest of the children within the DOM can respond to that. And most of those children uh, that respond to that are widgets. And that's what you know, Franco spends all, almost all of his time working on is making sure that the widgets and everything can respond to these classes appropriately. So these are things for you to be aware of. Um, you have some helpful things in there like uh, the view landscape orientation or orientation landscape. So you can actually look at the classes to determine what the state of the view is. Underneath that, you have the drawing surface, something that you basically won't work with uh, very often. Um, but more importantly, you'll work with the UI elements, which you can see here. 
and there's something called an Esri UI, and there's a manual and a default UI. So we're gonna dig into these a little bit deeper, but what I wanted to do is just, just expose to you what gets created underneath the hood, and we'll take a look at this too as we go along. So we'll start with view padding. So this is one of the features built into the 4 API um, that's really nice and basically allows you to space the map out and, and to basically provide uh, a spacing so that the, the geography can be offset and moved away from the rest of the interface. So the nice thing is that the center is, is still honored when the view padding is applied. So let me show you an example. So this is a very simple example where we're padding the top. So this is the actual object structure here. It's just being rendered. And the nice thing about the view is when the view is created, you can access and affect the padding instantly. You don't need to wait till when or then, okay, for anything further. As soon as the object is created, you can apply padding. So here we're reading 55, and that's how we're able to get this offset, and our, our widget here will automatically displace itself 55 pixels from the top. So we did that without code, I mean, without any CSS, I should say. So we'll take a look at what it looks like here. Go into the view, look at the padding, and all we're doing is we're adding this line of code right here. So we're padding top 55. So that's gonna pad 55 pixels. It's gonna move the UI down 55 pixels and displace it for you, so that way we can conveniently add this title bar at the top. So what does that look like if we, did, if we were to do a browser inspect. All right, so let me set this up. Make it a little bigger. All right, so if we look at the view div, which we just described, and then we go into the root, then you'll see that the Esri UI container has top 55 pixels set. Okay, so this is one of the only times that we actually inject to the style itself on the actual UI object, all right? So how that got there was through code. I didn't need to offset that using CSS or anything. Okay, so this is one of the new patterns and one of the advantages of using the 4 API. Frank, did you have anything else you want to say? Now? Yeah, um, so the whole idea behind the UI is to give you an easier way of, set up your, of setting up your applications layout, so instead of having to worry about thinking of the offsets that you're currently applying and if you add something like a new widget and having to update the current changes that you have to accommodate for the new thing that you're adding, that's kind of like the idea to take that all away from your mind and just by using the UI API, you can just add elements to the different corners uh, in this case and not have to worry about any, uh, anything else. The, the whole positioning will be taken care of uh, automatically for you, so yeah. Cool. So that's view padding, it's a very simple example. Um, I'll show you a, a few more complicated examples uh, coming up. Um, so let's take a look at some other features that the Forex API brings to the table, and that's the, the concept of giving you some uh, ability to listen to the size and resize on the view. So we'll go here and look at events. All right, so you'll see that the size has already been announced to us up top here, and well, right now we're not resizing, and Franco added these nice little emojis. Um, and as I'm resizing, you can see the emoji changes his face, and then when I stop, he changes back again. So he's crying, and then, I don't know, he's kind of happy or frustrated. The, I like emojis. That's... He does. <laughs> so what we're trying to show you here is that we set up some watch handlers here on the size, and size is really busy. So if you're going to build an app, like for example, if, if I make this uh, small enough, then I'm listening to when the, f when the size is 544 pixels, um, then I change the UI. But that's a very busy thing to do is if I'm listening to the size uh, handler. But resizing only occurs when I start moving. So when I start moving, it changes, and then when I stop moving, it changes back. So that's an event that's already throttled for you. You don't need to throttle that. It's only gonna happen on the start and, and the stop of a resize when, when an application or a page loads or it's resized itself. So how you do that is as simple as setting up some watch utilities. 
So I'm watching the size for the view, and then I'm watching uh, the resizing events for the view. I'm either setting the emoji or I'm just writing out. But this is really expensive, right? So for each pixel change, um, I'm potentially, I have to do a test and then I'm setting the title to either visible or invisible based on the size. So there's even better ways to do this, but I wanted to show you if you need to listen for pixel, pixel, pixel by pixel resize changes, then you can do that using the JavaScript API. You don't need to listen to Windows events. Um, just adding to what Alan said, um, the properties that he's using to make this example work are all driven through properties themselves on the view. So there are a lot of there are a few properties on the on the view that you can kind of if you're watching, you can get notified when uh, there are, the view is, like Alan stated earlier, is watching for the view and updating some of the properties internally so you don't have to do it yourself. So it's, uh, again, trying to lessen concerns for you. Traditionally, we would listen to the window resize event. And they would have to throttle that, and different browsers emitted it, uh, the event at different rates and so forth. So if we back up a little bit further and improve our application further, we can look at breakpoints. So there are breakpoints that are set into the view, okay? And this is inside of the JavaScript API. So these are the defaults that you're seeing here from extra small to extra large. So what are breakpoints? Let's take a look. And these are mission critical. So you can think of these as like, almost like the at media breaks that you would set up. So right now you can see we're set at extra large, or the view is detected that it's at an extra large breakpoint and its height is medium. Um, and then as I move and make it smaller, we'll eventually hit large, which is less than 1,200 pixels, medium, which is less than 1024, small, less than 780, and then finally uh, less than 544, so that's extra small. So those are five breakpoints that you can get hooks into and that are gonna fire at certain times. So you can build a fully responsive application uh, just by watching this uh, width breakpoint and height breakpoint property on the view itself. So I have a little switch case statement here, and based on the situation, I'm either going to react to extra small or extra large in this case. And I just set the title visible um, and not visible. So that's it. It's really that simple to listen to these breaks. Now here's the cool thing is I have a little bit of code here um, that shows that I've actually overridden the break point. So the extra small break point is now 400 pixels instead of 544, which is the default. So you can set as, you know, the breaks any way you want. Maybe you want to match the breakpoints in the internal API to match Bootstrap's breakpoints or something that you've already implemented. So that's really super powerful. I want to show you guys that and a nice little app to, uh, to get you going. Just adding to what Alan said, the, all those breakpoints get applied, get reflected on the CSS classes that also are on the view. So the, it, if your application is, qualifies under the breakpoint of medium uh, width, but extra small height, the, a prop, the proper CSS classes will be applied to the view, so giving you another option to kind of build your selectors. And um, the, the only thing that you need to, if you are going to provide your own breakpoints, the only requirement is that they are uh, logical and go in order, so you don't want the extra large being smaller than the uh, something smaller, so just something to keep in mind. And you'll get a, uh, message in the console if you provide something that looks invalid. So this is what he was referring to in terms of the classes that are being applied. So when those breakpoints are being hit, and are, are being hit, then you'll see that these classes are actually changing at the top level of the view. So if you have an override or something in there that you want to apply, when the, the size is view extra large, and you can apply that to the pop-up or something like that. So that's how it works, that's how break points work within the system, but they're fully controllable by you, and it's a really nice feature. I use it all the time. Okay, moving right along. Um, let's talk about the UI. So we'll, as Franco mentioned earlier, we've tried to simplify the UI and make it easy for you. So we have a couple corner containers. They have some default offsets. Uh, they respect view padding, and they make it easy. So let's take a look. 
So what I've done here is, uh, after the view loads, I just outline what these corner containers look like. So there's four corner containers that are in the default UI. And you can see I can just tap on these little areas and it just you know, hides and, and shows the components. And it's just one example of something that could be done. Um, you could fly the controls in and out as the cursor moves to those areas and stuff like that. So you can, you can do some really neat things. But you have four containers to work with. Um, you can stack the controls in different um, orders if you want. You could override some CSS to do that. Um, but it's, it's really straightforward. So what does the code look like? And in this case, this is the default UI container. And basically the heart of the code is right here. We're adding these different components and we're giving it a, a position location of top left, right, top bottom, or top right, left, bottom, etc. So basically you have those selectors to set and you can do it all programmatically and there's no CSS overrides here whatsoever. So that's the default UI container. Um, there's also a manual container. So the manual container is like the full space that's available. It's not four containers. It's actually the full view that's available and it's also padded. So let's take a look at that one. So this is the manual container and you can see the perforated line. It's just, it's just all around the edge of the view here. And you're probably wondering, well, why do we have this container? Well, you can see that the scale bar here is, is at the bottom at the center. So how do you put a UI control in the center if you have four containers? So that's why we have an optional container for you. And if we want, we can go and look inside of the DOM, see what this looks like. Go into the view, expand the root, expand the UI. And then here we can see we've got the, the manual container and we have the corner container. Now the manual container has my scale bar widget in it. It also has a few other things. It has the pop-up in it. It has the attribution, right? Because it makes sense. The attribution has to stretch the entire width at the bottom. So it needs to be in a container that's the full size of the view. So this is an option for you. And how do you set that up with code? It's actually pretty easy. When you're adding components, to the view, so like, like the scale bar here, uh, you set the position to manual. You set the position to manual, which before we set it to top right or top um, uh, left, etc. You can set it to manual and we will automatically put it in this container for you. Now the one thing I do here is I do add uh, a little bit of CSS styling so that I can tell that particular object where to go within that large container. So that's an option for you. The, so the manual container is padded, but the, the, the main purpose is if you want to take control of the positioning yourself, you have, this is the option that you would take. So you just add your element or widget and then you take control of the CSS. So it's for those cases. And yeah, the special cases that we handle like Alan showed. Okay. So that's the manual container. And then there are times when you just want your own container. And so what we wanted to show you is just basically how you can safely put your own UI container inside of the view and not affect other things. So how do you do that? So here's another example. So this looks very similar to, to everything else that we've seen, but when we look at the DOM underneath the hood, we can see that we have one container that's been padded, right? So we talked about this before. So that's the standard UI container. That UI container has the corner in the manual. So we've added our own container here. It still uses Esri UI. So we borrow that class. Here's our custom container. And I put the legend and I put the attribution in there. So in this particular case, the idea is we want to pad and displace the map, and we still want to be able to dock and see the control. On the other, if we were to use another container, then the pop-up would actually overlie the legend in that case. So we're basically pulling the legend out of the normal view and moving it to the side. So it's a nice little trick if you guys want to do it. Um, there's a little sample here, obviously, on how to do that as well. Oh, I should show you the code because it's a little bit different than some of the other things. 
Uh, I'll just show you how it's set up, and it's really simple. So we create a div element here. We add some of the um, Esri classes to it, like the Esri UI class. Uh, then we append a child, and then we put things into it, like the legend, and we put the attribution into that container. So this is really it. We're just dynamically creating this container, and then we're putting widgets in it. It's very simple. OK. Um, widgets. So sometimes you want to implement the widget from a Dojo programming perspective, okay? And, and, and uh, Matt Driscoll and, and Franco showed us how to do that in a presentation earlier today, which is fantastic. There are other times you just want to put a button, your own custom button, on the map. And that button will do something like bring up a panel or hide or show another UI element. So if that's the case, then here's a really fast and easy way and how to do that. So this is, I call this a custom button, and as you can see up here in the corner, it's just a, this little stacked uh, layers button, and I can toggle, I use it to toggle the layer on and off. That's all it does. It's very, very super simple. So how do I achieve that? So if we go to custom button, we can take a look at the source, and it looks a little bit similar to what we saw before. We create a DOM element, we give it some Esri classes so that it behaves and it looks and it feels like the rest of the, the classes out there and the rest of the components out there. And then we even add a span here and we even borrow the Esri uh, icon that's provided with the fonts that load. And then we add that UI element. And this is the wonderful thing. I mean, Franco did a great job on this because the UI has an add method and it takes any element that you want. As long as you're a DOM element, right, it will take your element and put it in a corner container or wherever you want. So I just put it in the corner container. I specify top left, because that's where I want it to go. And, and that's it. And then here's the rest of the code down here where I have an uh, event listener and I'm just clicking and I'm just toggling the legend on and off. So it's super simple. This is a super fast and, and easy way to add UI without having to implement, you know, go through a full implementation of, uh, of, a, of a Dojo widget itself. Yeah, the, the cool thing about these samples is that they're just using plain JavaScript. So if, if that's your, what you like, that's a good option. Okay, then there's a custom control, which is just a sidestep from what we just covered. So this is the case where you don't want a button, you want your own thing on the display. So it's down here in the bottom center, as you can see. So this is a little coordinate control, and it's rendering the location and the zoom level and the, and the uh, scale. So how do you achieve that? Well, the nice thing about what we're presenting today is we're kind of building on the concepts that we covered earlier. So we create a div element, Except this time, when we add it to the UI, we actually add this coordinate control to the manual container. So we specify manual, and this thing has enough smart, so it has a widget center as a CSS class that's defined up here, which we can see. It's basically just setting up its centering, and then it's added to the manual container. And then just a little bit of code down here, of course, to listen for the pointer move, and then to refresh the coordinates on it. So that's how simple it is just to add something. And again, I'm using the existing manual container in this case, uh, which is different than using the default container in the last example. OK. So let's talk about pop-ups. Uh, we have some extremely powerful pop-ups built in. And I can't even believe the amount of engineering and design cycles that went in to building the, the 4X pop-ups. Um, so I want to show you some of the features to show you that you, you have full control of the pop-up. You can make it do lots of things. Um, so hopefully this will give you some ideas. So in this example here, um, basically the pop-up is set to auto as the default. So what does that mean? So what that means is if I start to change the size of the application that it's going to dock at some point. So the, that's called a breakpoint. So it's docking right now, or, or it's breaking at 544 pixels. So 
as a developer, I have options. Um, I can actually change that and say, you know what, I actually don't want docking. So I can set the breakpoint property to false and then the pop-up doesn't dock. So I may have a use case for that and you may have a valid use case for that and that's fine. Uh, another way to do it is just to dock uh, earlier. So we can dock, for example, at 768 pixels. So when I get to that setting, it's gonna dock. So it docks to the desktop side because it's not ready to dock to the mobile side until it hits 544. So you can control these breaks um, if you want. The other thing you can do is you can set where the docking happens. So for example, you can dock to, you know, to the bottom, like the bottom center if you want, and you can, you can force the application to dock there. And you can see the little icon changes here as well that gives you an indication of where it's going to dock. So you have full control of the docking. Um, don't, don't ever be shy. Uh, there was something else I wanted to show you. Oh, that's right. When I dock the, uh, let's dock it in the top right as an example, then I can listen to events, I can watch events, and you notice that I hide the legend in this case, right? Because I don't want those two controls overlapping at that point in time. So how you do that is super simple, and I'll just point out how it happens. So I'm setting up a watch, and I'm listening to when the dock is enabled, it's visible, or its current position is set, and if it meets those criteria, uh, that it's in the top right, then I'm going to set the legend to invisible. So I basically just apply a class and then remove a class. So there's a little bit of CSS happening here, but you know, invisible is just basically setting uh, the display to collapse in this particular case. Okay, so a little example there, hopefully to help you out, to help you control your docking and where the application is set up. Let's talk about alignment. Alignment is actually something different. So alignment is how the pop-up aligns itself based on where it is on the map. So obviously there's some intelligence built in here. So when I tap on features, the pop-up is looking at where it is on the display and it's going to try to align itself as best it can. Um, so you can override that and say, I actually want the pop-up to always be on the bottom for my particular use case. You may have features on top or you may have a large pin that you want to show or something like that. So you can just set it in this case to bottom center. So you have all these different uh, options. Um, it's kind of fun just to go through them and play around with them. So that's the alignment property uh, and you just set that up by setting that property here on the pop-up. Here's our chooser, we're getting the position, and we're setting it to the alignment property on the pop-up. Okay, um, let's see, sizing. This is the question that I get quite often, and that is how do I change the sizing or how do I fix the sizing of my pop-up? So let's take a look at what we're talking about. So here, so by default, the pop-up is going to resize itself as best it can to, according to the, the display size. So in, in this case, I wanna keep the pop-up a fixed size. So you can see it's not changing size. It's not changing size until I hit a particular breakpoint, which in this case is 544, which is the extra small breakpoint, and then I lock it in to be 250 pixels. Okay, so it's always gonna be 250 pixels inside of the small, extra small breakpoint. It'll be, I think, 450 here, and then when I dock it, so there's a couple different sizes to contend with. So when it's docked here, it's actually at 550, and when it docks here, it goes to 100% width. So there's a couple levels of CSS uh, to think about, and let me show you how this is handled. So this is one of the few times that we need to actually use CSS overrides so we need to override, in this case, the small, medium, and, and large uh, breakpoints that are being applied to the view. So we set it to 450. So we set up the, the, the desktop floating size, the dock size, and then we set up, in this case, the extra small size as well. So this is the CSS required overrides for doing that. And again, you're overriding the, uh, the Esri pop-up main container. That's the container that will respect sizing and be affected by it. 
Okay, um, the last one I want to show you here on pop-ups is the concept of uh, auto-centering. So when you have uh, a desktop application, you don't have to worry about auto-centering auto so much because you have so much real estate. But if we move this down to a mobile size, then this is when auto-centering becomes very handy because I have a small display area and so this technique is used just by whenever there's a new feature that's selected, it recenters the pop-up and it makes sure that it isn't docked in this particular case. So it's a nice little um, technique that you can use to improve the UI and the user experience. And you can see how to do it here. Um, this is really the crux of the code where we're listening for a selected feature. And then if we're in an extra small uh, break size, then we're gonna go to that particular target and, and center the display. Okay, so that's basically how you set up uh, a mobile, uh, super mobile friendly pop-up if, if they're not working for you out of the box. That's something to keep in mind too. Uh, the default settings should get you pretty far along the way. And, um, but if you need to override them, then of course, that's what we're showing you here today. Panels. Uh, inevitably, you're going to need to add some sort of panel to your application. So to show some information, you may have a workflow that's based on a panel. So uh, again, we're going to build on some of the principles and concepts that we already talked about. And, and that is like this, this ability to add a button. So we already know how to add a button. We know how to add it to the corner container, right? We covered that. So now when I click on this button, I actually add padding to the map. So that's actually not displacing, I'm not adding a CSS class to the view. I'm just padding the view over 250 pixels and then I'm adding um, the legend in a panel to the right. Okay, so that's a nice technique. It's very easy to implement and I'll show you how it's set up. We have a panel up top, we have a button, and again, we've seen this already, we're adding the button to the top right of the, the default UI, and then we're listening to an event. And the two things that happen when we, when we listen to this event, and this is the click event for the button, is we add padding, so we set the view padding through code, and then we either add or remove a, a class to show or hide our panel. And that's it, that's the entire application. So that's how you achieve these panels and add them to your display um, on the map view. The value in this approach is that, compared to if you were offsetting with just pure CSS, is that if you notice when, when the panel comes in, the extent of interest is still preserved. So if this, this will guarantee that if, you're, if, you're, if you are interested in a particular area, and just by applying padding, it'll still be honored and, and visible in your application. Okay. Um, these are like my favorite ones. So um, the responsive padding, this is, this is our re responsive expand is what I call it. So the expand is a component in a widget that's provided out of the box. So just keep an eye on the, the legend as we approach the mobile size. So now we're in mobile size, so we removed the title, which we already saw and know how to do. But then what we did is we put the legend inside of this expand widget. So the expand widget is just an out of the box widget and the content that we're giving it is the content of the legend widget. So this is a nice little feature on how to build a responsive application going from a mobile size to a desktop size. And then of course it just disappears at desktop size because we're just interested in the legend in full screen. So one of the patterns that I really like is that one. The last one, let's see, is the pop-up panel. Okay, so this is my super favorite one. All right, so here you're looking at a panel with the legend, right? Well, keep your eye on it, and as I touch features, it turns into a pop-up. And if I go back over to the left-hand side and click on the legend button, then it turns back into a legend. And then now it's a pop-up. Well, the reality of it is it's always a pop-up. So I'm actually reusing the pop-up here as, as a more advanced window, and I can reuse it 
which is fantastic. And why would I do this? So here, here's like one of the advantages. So as I change the size of the pop-up with the legend, it has this ability to work very nicely in a mobile environment so I can scroll and look at it. I can collapse, I can expand it. So I can do all of the things that a pop-up does except it has my content in it. So in this case, I put the legend in this particular pop-up, but you can put whatever um, div elements that you want in there. So I call this the pop-up in the panel. All right, so we're, we're almost gonna switch gears here because we're getting towards the hardcore CSS that we're gonna look at. The first part here is we may want to apply um, CSS styling and the easiest way to do that is to just borrow some of the themes that we have. So we have themes that are CSS files set up on our CDN, and these are all the different ones that you can see here, light blue, light red, light purple, etc. And you can access those and use those in your application. And this doesn't require uh, applying any CSS overrides or compiling any SAS. This is just using what's on the CDN. And so out of the box, you have a few styles available. Um, such a, so there are two main themes. You could say we have a light theme and a dark theme, and each of these themes have a variation on color. So if you like any of these, it's already built for you. Just It's a matter of using the proper uh, link to the CDN for the theme. Yeah, and of course, I'll point you to the documentation. I'm just looking at the JavaScript API, where you could, you could scroll through. You see there's default style sheets, and then they will talk about um, here are the different colors for the themes. So they're all listed here on the CDN. Okay, so that's default themes. Then here's something that's probably, we've probably all encountered this at one point or another, and that's where we want to just override the elements themselves. So in this case, I call this like a custom CSS theme. So I'm overriding a number of things. So the buttons are actually smaller. So there are, I think, 28 pixels in this case. Uh, the internal icons are a little bit smaller as well. The search control is a little bit smaller. The background colors have changed, obviously, because I'm trying to theme this to match everything. So how do you accomplish that? There are some examples um, inside of our help system, so you can look at those. Uh, this is probably a little bit more intricate, though. Uh, but the basis of it is you apply a, a theme style at a high level and probably on the body tag, which is where it usually occurs, and we override things like Esri widget, Esri button, and then we apply a background color and a foreground color. So these are kind of like, this is the basics of getting the color theme set. Now, if you're gonna override the widget themes or the, budget, or the button themes, then you should always handle the focus and the hover as well. So we offset those colors, and then we go through and we grab the zoom. Like I said, we set the zoom buttons to 28 pixels. We set the internal icons to 14 instead of 16 pixels. Um, we grab the base map toggle. I didn't even notice it. That's right, it's down here in the corner, so the base map toggle is uh, a lot smaller in this case. And we change the scale bar. Now here's the interesting thing. Um, if I was just to leave all the code as it is, and I didn't have these overrides for the search, then what would happen is my search, the internals of my search would turn orange as well, and you actually wouldn't be able to see the search bar on the UI. So it's a little bit dangerous to go through and apply background colors to things like Esri widget because it's going to change the background color of every widget that apply to that style, which is every widget in the system. Okay, so here I override the override. So I provide a more specific override so that I have a white search widget. Um, and I think I do the same thing for the attribution because I didn't want the attribution to have the orange color either. So I have to reset these. So if you need to do a small amount of CSS override uh, styling, then I think that's fine, just like we have here. But if you're going to go uh, much further and you want a more rich and predictable theming mechanism, then we're gonna look at how um, Franco is gonna tell us to set it up. So I think that's all we have for here. Cool, so yes, I will show you
uh, a more um, scalable approach if you are interested in theming. So the previous example works fine, like Alan said, if, in, if you have just a few tweaks or overrides that you want to set on your application, but this strategy is not very, it's, it's brittle because since you're overriding and you actually need to inspect the DOM to kind of get an idea of what you need to override, if a, it's, it is possible that in, in one update you, those overrides may need some tweaking and there's no direct way of you knowing exactly when, when stuff breaks. So the other approach that we have is to use SAS and internally in our team, we use SAS to build our, all of our CSS and it's possible right now for you to look at all the, the these files to get an idea of how this works. So if, there's a link on the in the styling guide page that will take you to this readme on how to set up set up a SAS environment and I will actually go to the repo where we have all these classes. <coughs> so in this repo here we have all the source for the themes and base will contain all the the files that are crucial for building all of our themes. And then you get folders for, for the actual themes themselves that we are authoring. So if you go into the light, for example, you can see that we have a SAS file here. And it's pretty, pretty simple because at this point, the light version is our default. But if you look at another one, such as the dark red, for example, you can see that we are just providing some overrides, and I'll get into that in a little bit, uh, but, and then we just import the core of the theme, which is the, the, the main structure that would yield the, the white theme. So the idea is that by default you get the white theme, but before you import core, you, give, you specify the overrides, and then internally, the rest of the system will take care of, of using these variables across so this is more flexible because as we add more widgets, all of the widgets are using, reusing these variables. So if you override and create a theme with a sp sp particular color scheme, it's, it's guaranteed that these will apply to new widgets that are coming from the API side. And the way this works is that the, the base provides files for all of our colors, our icons, images, every widget has a corresponding SAS file as well. So if I look into the widget folder, you'll see that we have one per each of our supported widgets. So you, this gives you a, a, an idea on how we author the themes for the, the CSS for all of our widgets. And going back to what, we've, uh, what Alan's been talking about, the, you can see how the UI CSS actually works and how it's set up by browsing these files as well. So here is all the configuration that goes into the UI for the corners, the manual container, all of that. You also get the styles that define how the view works. And we also have some functions, mix-ins, and sizes. So if you want to take more control, you have access to all of these and you can reuse them as you see fit. So the current approach requires a little bit of setup. So I've actually gone ahead and created a project to make it easier to work with these. And I'll show it an example of this in a few minutes, but um, the idea is that you clone this project, you run npm install, and then it'll set your environment up and it's just a matter of you tweaking or playing with the, CS, the SAS and then you'll get an immediate, immediate feedback on the changes because there's a preview app. So let's just show how that works. So I am right now in this project and I've already cloned it, but by default you will get uh, just a pre the preview page and once it installs, it'll set up the structure for your project and in essence, this is, this is an environment, a, a tool that will actually help you author a theme and make it easy to host. So whatever changes you make will produce a theme that can, you can just copy and host on your web server. 
and there you go, you have a new theme. So the way it works is uh, once you clone it, you would run npm install, and this is gonna set all these files in the background, and it will load in a preview application that comes by default. So here it is, this is using the default um, theme and the default, sorry, the default theme and um, using that preview page that it showed before. So if I go to my main application and start playing with, for example, background color, if I set it to, um, I don't know, red, not going to be pretty, but you, you see it'll update immediately. So this is pretty neat because you have this, you clone it, you install it, and then automatically you have this, everything set up for you to start playing around and immediately getting feedback on the changes that you're making. So if I go back to the resource page, we have a, actually on this page, there is a small example on it's not this one, it's the, yeah, so in our resource page, this is, there's a small example on getting this, authoring this green theme, and before it required a little bit more steps, but now, if I just copy these over, you should see it's coming in. And the, the as I said, the main idea is as, as you make these changes, you get an instant preview, and it makes it easier as, we add more widgets, it's, there's guarantee to be styled accordingly. So there you go, this is another tool that you can actually take advantage of and learn um, also. Can you show them the reference in the uh, HTML page that you're referencing the local CSS the, build? This one, the, the yeah. one that we're seeing right now? Yeah. Okay, sure. So as you can see, this is a very simple application, the index page, it's creating a map and the view that we're currently seeing on the side, and I'm just creating a, view, a search and using the view UI to add it. And once the view is ready, I'm just making the pop-up show up in via the search. And another neat thing is since this index page is, you can update it to be whatever you want. I can actually go ahead and kind of use the, the, app, the template application that we were seeing before. So just to kind of make the point across that it's very easy to kind of get instant feedback that of, of the, theme, the theme that you're authoring. So if I wanted to change the colors, um, no guarantees on how it's gonna look, but. I already changed. Okay, oh, it's because I need to relaunch. I disconnected it. So there we go. So it still needs a little bit more tweaks to reach what Alan showed, but it just by changing these two variables, we're getting pretty close. So yeah, that's, that's, I really like the, the idea of having immediate feedback, and, and especially with this tool. So hopefully you'll find it useful, and if please let me know in the repository if you have any issues with it, and I look forward to kind of improving on it. And the, oh, I'll just show them the, the way. So the steps, just to reiterate, you clone the repo, and then you run npm install. You just add your overrides, and you can host the, the compiled theme. So every time you make modifications, this, this folder would get updated. So this is the only thing that you need to, to copy over or provide via a web server. and. If you look at the index page, you will find um, that I'm referencing this, the actual build theme, and that's it. So the nice thing is that you're, you own your CSS at this point. You own the CSS for the build, so you can point to the CDN for the 4.7 or 4.6, whatever build that you're using, and then you can point to the CSS that you have on your own server. So uh, today we talked about a number of UI design patterns in which we could leverage the 4.0 or the 4x API 
uh, to make it easier to build these responsive applications. Um, there's a bunch of patterns in the repository that I showed you. Again, you can get to uh, everything from slides.com, uh, Ala Framboise. And yeah, please feel free to leave some uh, session feedback and have a great evening tonight. Thank you very much.